Sung Jin-ho's very existence is one that could topple the dynamic of guilds as we know it. Right now, there's a delicate balance between the top five in the country, but with each constantly vying for that number one spot, all it takes is another A or S rank to completely change that. This is what Ahn is hoping for with Sung Jin-ho, and it's his power that he believes will bring success to the White Tiger Guild. It's a core focus in both the episode and the novel, but there was quite a bit more to Ahn and his struggles in the novel. Things like why Sung is the most important hunter to appear in years, and how it is his recruitment would change pretty much everything for him. So, as we take a look at what was left out from the anime, it's that and Sung's new levels which you're going to want to stick around for. Before that though, I just want to remind you guys to check out the level up collection, since in only two weeks they're going to be gone forever. They're all designs inspired by solo leveling, and they're professionally printed onto the highest quality heavy cotton shirts we can get our hands on. They're a product I'm really proud to call my own, since it's all done in-house and shipped by us. We do ship internationally, so wherever you are, you can pre-order yours using the link in the description. Not only will this help to support the channel, but it'll also directly fund the creation of new collections for all the other anime I talk about. Plus, for anyone who follows us on Instagram, I'll be giving away a shirt every stream on Sunday until the collection is done. You can find the link to that down in the description too. But anyway, episode 10. What is this, a picnic? Covering chapters 35 to 37 from the manhwa and chapters 35 to 45 from the web novel. The manhwa this time didn't really have anything too important, but it was in the novel that a lot was cut from Ahn and his mission to recruit Sun. Pretty much five chapters delving into the guild life and what it's like to be working as the chief recruiter for one. Before we get to that though, the first scene was of course that conversation between Juhi and Sung. An initially silent stroll due to an increasingly awkward dynamic between them, but one that had to be had since this would be the last time the two would see each other for a while. Before, Juhi would have had no problem talking to Sung like this, but ever since he got stronger and his presence more intimidating, things were at the point where she didn't even know how to start a conversation with him anymore. It was a massive change she promised she wouldn't ask him about, but one that was definitely bothering her for reasons she didn't even know herself. More than anything, she wanted to ask if she could see him again, but even that was too much as she felt words like that would just alienate him. So, with her only regret being that she wouldn't be able to see Sung as often, Juhi would declare her retirement and leave things at that. A somber end to a relationship I wish we could have gotten to see more of. It was once Sung had gotten home from that, that a package would be waiting for him from the association. It was a replacement phone for the one he'd lost during the double dungeon incident. This isn't really all that important, but it does tie up a loose end in the form of her. The thirsty nurse who had asked for Sung's number a few episodes back. It turns out she'd been texting him quite a lot, and while it wasn't at the point where her messages were particularly annoying, Sung felt that if he did reply they would probably get to that. So, out of a precautionary measure to avoid someone who was potentially clingy, Sung would ignore the nurse's texts and leave her on red. Now, the following day Sung would start his 19 raids with Jinho, and when he heard Jinho would be picking him up and driving him there, what he expected was a fancy car only someone like him could afford. When he pulled up in an old utility van not aligned with his wealth, that's when Sung realized Jinho was a lot more diligent than he initially gave him credit for. Reason being that a van like this was a lot more inconspicuous than whatever luxury sports car he usually drives. So if their goal was to do these gates in the most discreet way possible, then this van was a huge step towards maintaining that. It was a brand new purchase he had made specifically for this. Fast forward to when we meet the hunters forming their party, and while they had no problem sitting outside for a sum of what was essentially $2,000, they did feel bad knowing they may have just assisted in someone else's suicide. No one wanted to know a fellow hunter was going to die in the gate in front of them, but that was the situation they were facing when they searched up who Sung and Jinho were. They also felt a bit of regret knowing they wouldn't be paid for the other 18 raids they were promised. We saw their reaction when Sung and Jinho proved otherwise, so the rest of day one continued with zero hassle whatsoever. It was by the end that Sung had gained two new skills, and his dash had leveled up, making its enhancement 10% more effective. As for what it is these two new skills did, advanced dagger technique made him stronger when fighting with a dagger. It was a reward for his ever-increasing proficiency with it, and as such provided 33% increased damage whenever he was using one. This also came with the brand new active skill critical attack, and this simply made it easier for Sung to target his opponent's vitals. It provided the most optimum way to attack with his daggers, and as such would guide him to the weak spot most lethal to them. 
after which additional damage would be applied if the weak spot was hit. That may sound standard given our own perception of critical attacks in video games, but for Sung this was a lot bigger than any of us may have considered. What I mean is that, for him who'd just been mindlessly slashing in hopes of landing a hit, a clear path to maximum damage was literally game-changing. Before he'd only ever achieved it a couple of times, but it's when he did that he knew the fight was over. Like, with Kang in this dungeon or the monsters here, Sung knew the moment his dagger made impact the fight was finished. There was this satisfying feeling which made him certain of it. So, to be able to achieve that feeling with every attack, well, that was kind of like finding water in the desert. It had turned Sung into a monster killing machine, a buff to his efficiency that made leveling up significantly faster. Day 2 was where all that became evident since every monster was effectively being one shot now. Sung would activate his critical attack skill, then his next attack would obliterate whatever enemy he was targeting. Unfortunately, that came with the expense of depleting his mana, but luckily he could just refill it with shop bought mana potions an infinite supply that essentially funded itself. Naturally, this made Jinho curious, so out of all the things that he could have asked a question about, it was this strange blue liquid that made him finally say something. This led Sung to test what he could and couldn't do with them, and that in turn led to a discovery towards even faster dungeon clearing. So first Sung wanted to know what cannot be traded meant, and that simply indicated that the item would disappear if placed into someone else's hands. It would remain so long as it was in his own possession, but the moment it left, the item would vanish. That's not to say it couldn't be used on others though, since when testing if he could just pour the potion into Jinho's mouth himself, he found the potion remained and even applied its effects to the person ingesting it. It was a revelation that would save the two of them hours. Before, Jinho had been working beyond the point of exhaustion, but now that potions removed that fatigue completely, he found he didn't even have to stop to eat anymore. The two could work non-stop without feeling even a bit of tiredness, thus allowing him to keep up with the rapid rate Sung was killing monsters at. This wasn't something Sung had done out of kindness for Jinho though, but was rather a necessary cost in which the return was calculated to provide more value. If it didn't, then there was no way Sung would have used his potions on Jinho like this. It was solely because the productivity was worth more than the value of the potion that Sung could afford to give them away like this. Of course, to Jinho, this was yet another gesture befitting the benevolent Sung Jinu, so to him it carried quite a bit of meaning. So much so that it would actually bring a tear to his eyes. This brings us now to day 3 of raiding, and after 7 raids, the two had accumulated over 600 million won together. Granted, Jinho did pay over a billion for them, but the returns from each were going straight to Sung. Never once did Jinho think the two of them would split the money, since to him, every bit of it was earned by Sung alone. It was a display of respect that reflected Jinho's ever-changing demeanor towards him. Now, it was around the same time that Jinho was buying all these gates that the White Tiger Guild would be going through a crisis because of it. You see, with no C-rank gates available to purchase, the guild's rookies could no longer be developed since that's what they used to train them. It was a phenomenon the guild had never been exposed to since the men responsible for securing them were extremely competent. As the chief and deputy of the White Tiger's second management division, it was only natural they'd be incredibly skilled at what they do. I mean, they did after all represent one of the top five guilds in South Korea. So, as the two in charge of the division responsible for recruiting new hunters and training them, the fact they had nothing to train their rookies with was an exceptional blunder the guildmaster was sure to scold them for. It was a crisis that required fixing immediately. As for how it even happened, well, let's just say Jinho flexed a bit too hard on them. I know in the anime they said he had bid 150 million, but in the novel and manhwa it was actually 250 million. He had bid 25% more than the max return one could possibly expect from a C-rank gate. Initially, his bid was only 70 million, but when the White Tiger Guild countered with their max bid of 100 million, Jinho just said screw it and edged out everyone with 250 million. It was an absurd sum one could only think that a crazy person would pay for. Their first thought was that it was another guild trying to hinder their development, but when they considered the all-out war such a move would trigger, there was no way anyone else was stupid enough to try and do that. Especially not to a guild as strong as the White Tiger Guild. That's when An's assistant would mention it was Sung and Jinho, and this would lead to the realization that Sung had reawakened. The anime skipped a few dots while On was connecting them, but the gist was a combination of factors which made it so incredibly obvious. The first was the three incidents which Sung miraculously survived, 
The second, the fact Jin Ho's father was actively recruiting S-rank hunters, then the third, the blazing speed in which the two of them were clearing out gates now. Even if he set aside the sheer impossibility of Kang losing to a one-armed mage-type hunter, those other two clues were more than enough to indicate Sung was something special. If anything, it painted the picture that Jin Ho's father was testing him, an assumption that made An think he still had time to recruit Sung himself. By knowing just how particular Jin Ho's father was when it came to his public image, there was no doubt in An's mind that that's exactly what was happening here. He felt he had just come across the ultimate discovery, the perfect opportunity in which a reawakened hunter was prime for poaching. Even if Sung didn't rank high on the retest, just his advertising power alone would provide value which couldn't be bought with money. Such was the influence of those who reawakened like this. So, for now, An knew he still had time since Sung's retest hadn't yet happened, but the moment it did was when the competition would become intense, thus the reason he wanted to get ahead now. In fact, it was so important that he felt the need to go out into the field himself, something he hadn't done in the two years since becoming chief. It was this type of initiative which landed on the position he was in, and that was all thanks to his incredible instincts. If not for them, then not only would An not have become the youngest division head in the entire organization, but the White Tiger Guild as a whole wouldn't be the top five guild it is today. There was something special about the way he was able to read Hunters, and that same sense was now telling him that Sung was particularly special. He was the first recruit in a while to make his heart race. This made getting Sung their top priority, and it would lead him and his deputy to stake out the two gates Sung was supposed to be at today. They'd each gone to one individually, and their plan was to call the other as soon as Sung was spotted. Eventually, Sung would appear at the gate the deputy was at, and what the deputy would describe would serve as confirmation for everything An had theorized. You see, by seeing Sung and Jin Ho go into the gate alone, An had no reason to doubt anymore that this was in fact Jin Ho testing him. It was the only logical explanation for why the two of them would even try a gate by themselves. This gave On the confidence that he could poach Sung, because while he assumed Jin Ho to be wasting time verifying Sung's abilities, On on the other hand believed he could just swoop in and make an offer. An offer he felt Sung was certain to accept, and one he believed was a surefire victory for him. This, of course, wasn't how any of that turned out, but before we can even get to that meeting in the cafe, On would first tell his deputy to keep watching Sung. He wanted to see how long the gate would take to complete since the clearing time was a good indication of what Sung's rank would be. An A rank took somewhere around two hours to do one solo, so if Sung was above or below that, An could just adjust his estimations accordingly. When his assistant called back saying Sung had finished it in 30 minutes though, that's when An knew he was dealing with the unimaginable. He couldn't even fathom how strong someone would have to be to achieve that. What he initially thought was impossible was just proven otherwise in a way that completely shattered all his expectations. So now more than ever, An knew Sung needed to be recruited by him. As for how Sung was able to pull this off, it just so happened the monsters he was facing were of the werewolf variety, the kind in which his title allowed him to do 40% increased damage to them. It was this combined with all his other skills that allowed him to breeze through the entire dungeon faster than Jin Ho could even keep up. In fact, even if Jin Ho had 10 more hands, that still wouldn't have been enough to pick up all the essence cores fast enough. Sung had actually had to give him 5 healing potions just so he could keep on going. That was the last raid of day 3, and with time to spare on his daily schedule, Sung would ask Jin Ho to drive him to the mall. There was an instant dungeon that he had just unlocked there. This would grant him 2 more levels, then it was after that that he would receive a call from On. A voice that introduced themselves as part of the White Tiger Guild, and one that insisted they needed to meet in person. Sung suggested that they could meet in a couple of days, but when the voice insisted that they needed to meet now, Sung became a little bit wary. Especially since they mentioned that they were nearby, which was indication that they knew where he lived. This wasn't information publicly available, so the fact they had it meant that they had done a thorough investigation of him. It was a worrying concern that made it clear he wasn't being as discreet as he thought he was enough to accept the request and meet them immediately. This would lead to the meeting in the cafe, but in addition to all the stuff we saw in the anime, there was quite a bit of extra information regarding the White Tiger Guild and the actual offer they were making. So, out of the top 5 guilds in South Korea, the one that sits in first is the Hunters Guild. Before that it used to be the Reapers Guild, but after a few members left and started their own, the Reapers would fall in ranking and make way for the Hunters to take its place. It was those who had left that had started the White Tiger Guild, and in only a matter of years that guild would surpass even the Reapers. 
They had become far stronger than the guild they were once part of and were now gunning for the spot that the Hunter's Guild currently held. Such a position was one that was always unobtainable, but if Sung Jin was the person An thought him to be, then he was the piece they needed to finally take that number one spot, thus reinforcing the reason why An wanted to recruit him so bad. Now, normally any hunter would be awestruck when face to face with a top 5 recruiter, but in classic Sung fashion, he wasn't impressed at all. In fact, what An believed was a target of great desire for pretty much every hunter was to Sung nothing more than a casual business meeting. An had hoped he could use said desire to his advantage, but when he saw Sung couldn't even care less, he was a bit disappointed since he knew things weren't going to be easy for him. The only thing An had going for him was the fact Sung was yet to sign with Jinho, but that too was a misconception based on the assumption that they were testing him still. It was the one fatal flaw when coming to the table since the entire time he believed the opposition was underestimating Sung's true value. When he realized that that wasn't the case, once again, An was faced with the unimaginable. As for Sung, the offer to join the White Tiger Guild honestly wasn't a bad one. The only reason why he didn't was because there was literally zero need to do so. Since his value only increases every time he levels, there was no reason to think that Sung couldn't just solo a B or A rank dungeon next. The very gates which funded guilds into what they are today could potentially be sold by him and the profits completely monopolized by him. So, so long as he kept leveling up, that dream scenario definitely wasn't an impossible one. It was a thought that reaffirmed joining a guild simply wasn't necessary. Perhaps 50 billion would convince him otherwise, but unless An had the ability to make such a decision, nothing he could offer right now would change that. Now, when Sung did ask how much the White Tiger's guild building was worth, An had actually believed this to be an opportunity to flex a bit. He thought Sung was questioning the guild's financial power and believed this would be a good way to show off just how much of it they had. What An thought to be an advantage to him though was actually just Sung probing how much they could pay for him. A shocking revelation that once again shattered An's expectations of him. This would be where their conversation ends and it's after this that the story would go on to do a few things differently. The gates wouldn't be bought until the day after this one simply because Bake hadn't given permission to spend as much money as they needed to on them. He was in a fit of rage scolding An for not having done his job properly. This was because recruit training was essential, and if a guild couldn't even afford to train their own recruits, then that was a weakness the other guilds were sure to take advantage of. Even if they purchased gates outside of their own territory, to do so would hurt their image in a way that might be unrecoverable. It would be like announcing to the world that they didn't have the power to train in their own territory. A disgraceful message that might not sit well with future recruits. Fortunately, Sung's job change quest meant he needed to sell them, so that was a lucky turn of events providing a solution to this problem. Now, in between all this, there was Sung accepting Jinha's request to go to her parent-teacher meeting, a homemade vegetable juice given to Sung by An's deputy, then a little tease of a serial killer that's prowling around his neighborhood. All this happened on the morning before his raids on day 4, and they're the small events that develop the world around Sung. But yeah, that's pretty much everything we missed from episode 10. If you liked what you saw and want to see more, then be sure to leave a like on the video. You can also leave your rating of the episode to be part of the weekly community post. Now, don't forget there are only two weeks left with the level up collection, so if you want to get yours, then be sure to do so with the link in the description. I'll also be giving away another shirt on my stream on Sunday, so be sure to follow the Mugen Instagram if you want to be eligible for that. But anyway, as always, thank you so much for watching, and if you enjoyed this type of anime content, then you already know what to do. So, until next time. Ciao.